Stone soup. What's up with that? Why do you think I call it stone soup? What, does anyone know the story? Yes, ma'am. So yeah, great. Thanks. So what she said is that you know two people, two uh, people down on their luck, maybe homeless, who had very few resources, uh, and they thought that they could find these magic stones. Uh, and then go to the town square and say, we can make soup with the towns with this, these magic stones. And if only someone had a pot, uh, if we only had a pot to put these stones in, then maybe we could make a soup. And someone says, hey, actually, you know, I got this pot. Let's put some stones into it. And then they say, uh, you know, this soup would be so much better if all we had was a few chickens. And someone says, you know, as a matter of fact, we just slaughtered a few chickens and we have a couple left over. Let's see if we can put that into the soup. And then, oh, you know, this soup would be just a little bit better if we had some potatoes and so on and so forth until the whole community comes out of their houses to greet these strangers who really have nothing except a couple of stones that really aren't magic but they happen to you know, call them that. And eventually they have this beautiful stew that the whole community comes out, breaks out their ladles, fills up their bowls, and everyone gets nutrients. So you see where I'm going with that. We'll get back to this idea, but so much of what we do in homelessness is we talk about how homeless people are taking things from us, that they don't deserve to have a home, they don't deserve to have food, they don't deserve to be safe, not everyone, but there's a lot of that going on these days, especially uh, with the Trump administration right now. It's very hot in this subject. Um, and I wanna flip that conversation for today and think about how many strengths homeless people bring to the table. It may just be some stones, but it might be a lot of other things. And if we can build a structure where we recognize people's strengths, rather than see people as taking, it can really change the dynamic and gives us a much greater sense of commitment and community. And eventually, we can all dip our ladles into that soup and get nutrients if we play it right. So that's the metaphor for the talk today. My story, um, you know, I went to medical school 1984, if you can imagine. Um, and when I wrote my uh, personal statement to go to to apply to medical school. I actually said I want to be a doctor for homeless people. That was my goal, and that is what I have done since then. I've tried at times to work in other settings, and it just sort of this big uh, sucking sound that pulls me back to this work. Um, so I, I started a, a free clinic run by medical students in Yonkers, New York, back in 1986, and um, went to residency at San Francisco General, which is sort of a progressive family medicine residency, urban family medicine program that, you know, I wanted to go to one of the few in the country that was both a social justice and a medical a training, uh, an excellent medical training opportunity. Did that. And then, um, you know, traveled around the world for a while, and then I've been doing housing for homeless people for a long time. So back in 1996 or thereabouts, um, I was finishing my master's in public health, and was assigned to work at the health department in San Francisco. And the job that I was given, really without much of a choice, was to work with this guy named Mitch Katz, who was the head of the AIDS office at the time. And the job that I had was to um, run a program where we gave homeless people who were injection drug users and gay men who were exposed to HIV when a condom broke uh, antiretroviral medications that called post-exposure prophylaxis. And I was supposed to be the liaison to the homeless community since that was my area of expertise. And so I did that for a while. It was very intense, very uh, controversial, even though today we have something called PrEP, which at the time we thought would be completely impossible that we'd give gay men medications before they had sex to prevent getting HIV, but it works much better that way. Um, and Soon after that, it became pretty clear that to take care of people with HIV disease who are homeless doesn't really work very well. Even though we would incentivize people with these beepers that we gave them with little alphanumeric messages that would say, take your blue pills, Johnny, on their little beeper that would go off four or five times a day. It didn't really help until we housed them. So beginning in about 1998 or thereabouts, all that mattered to me as a doctor try trying to take care of homeless people was finding a way to do the one treatment that will improve the health of my patients, which is housing. 
and I've worked for the last 25 years to try to figure out how can the healthcare system align itself with the housing system so that we can use healthcare resources effectively so that homelessness becomes something we read about in the history books. I have had times of greater hope than right now, let me tell you. Uh, we had a good run of it for a while between 1999 and 2015 when I ran something in the health department called Housing and Urban Health, we produced 2,000 units of permanent supportive housing. Not so much since then. Getting better now, but uh, after Mitch Katz went down to Los Angeles, he became the health director in San Francisco, then became the health director in Los Angeles, and now he's the director of something called the, the Health and Hospitals Corporation, which is the largest public hospital system in the country in New York City. Um, and he was a huge supporter of the idea that housing is healthcare. And it, one of the reasons is because he has two siblings who have spent most of their adult life on the streets of New York. So having a health director who wakes up every morning with the empathy and understanding that the only thing that's gonna help most of the people he's charged to serve is a home, is a pretty cool place to, it's a pretty good person to work for if that's also what you believe is. So that's a little, little story about me. Um, Got two kids, 17-year-old and a 13-year-old wife who's a nurse practitioner and is getting her doctor and nurse, nurse uh, practice here at UCSF after you know, 50 years of life. Uh, she's here now getting another degree. So we're both deeply into UCSF. Um, during the introduction, you heard about this wacky thing called the UCSF Benioff Homelessness and Housing Initiative, and that's uh, how I became on faculty here because a dude named Mark Benioff who's like this you know, super rich guy who runs sales, Salesforce was out in front of uh, this thing called Prop C. How many of you heard of last, not, there are a couple Prop Cs. Prop C is about homelessness. How many of you heard about that? Some of you may have voted for it, I hope so. Um, Mark Benioff was out in front of that and trying to get San Franciscans to vote for it. it was, it's a tax on large companies, 0.5% sales tax on all companies over $50 million a year or more in revenue. That would create a, about a $300 million annual funding for homelessness. Uh, services and housing in this city. It passed with 61% of the vote, not getting to the two-thirds majority necessary to create a um, new tax it's stuck in the courts right now. Maybe it'll come out, but right now we don't have that money. But Mark Benioff was out in front of that and felt very exposed because he didn't have a lot of the data that he wished he had. So he turned to me and Margot Cushell, who's my colleague here at UCSF, and said, you know, if I, as this one of the richest dudes around, can't get all the information I need to make my case. Think of how much, how hard it is for everybody else, so many of you sitting in this uh, audience to know what's up with homelessness. So he asked us to run this initiative and that's why we're here, is to try to give you the facts and information about homelessness. And if I say anything that is, you know, you disagree with or offensive, I hope it's not offensive, but if I say anything, just shout it out. Get a small group, let's talk it through. So. This is a graph that looks at the wealth distribution uh, in this country. You can see that the top 10% of the people of the country have, uh, sorry, the top 10% of the, of the wealthiest people in the country have a majority of the wealth, and the bottom 50% of the people have this incredibly small sliver of wealth. Now, wealth is not how much you know, money you have in the bank necessarily, it's what your cumulative wealth is, and it's incredibly skewed towards the few. And this is a big change, as you can see. As recently as 1989, the distribution of wealth was much less than it is now. Now people like Mark Benioff and, and Bloomberg and uh, Jeff Bezos are, you know, three of the people in the United States uh, have more wealth than 50% at the bottom, right? It's an incredible distribution of wealth. This is one of the main drivers of homelessness today. So we can't talk about homelessness without talking about this wealth distribution gap. Similarly, here in California, actually this national data, you can see that the rate of rise in rent costs is dramatically outstripping the rate in rise in uh, salaries. So you have this you know, my, very small increase in, in salaries since 2001 to 2017, 0.5%. But the rate of rents across the country has gone up dramatically. So 
it's not very complicated math as to why there are so many new people ending up on the streets of our cities. Is we have not had an increase in salaries, and we've had a huge increase in rent, and done. So when I started this work, as I mentioned back in the mid, early 90s, almost everyone I was taking care of, with, you know, living with severe and persistent mental illness, substance use disorders, and chronic medical problems, has really shifted in the last three to four years. Where right now, about one of every two homeless people on the streets of San Francisco have only been homeless for a year. And I'll show you some other data that's just really dramatic about this, this influx or inflow of new homeless people, which is changing the epidemiology dramatically. And we have to also change our response, which will get us back to stone soup in a bit. And homelessness is not distributed across all race ethnicities equally. So what this chart shows is that here in California, the percent of African Americans in the general population is about 6%. But the percent of African Americans in the homeless population is almost 30%. Similarly, if you look in other race ethnicities, there's a big difference between the general population and the homeless population. What's going on? And one of the things I want to leave you with is very quickly in homelessness, we want to see the problem as an individual problem. Individual failings, poor choices, bad disease. You have to see homelessness as a systems problem, where the reason for this incredible disparity in race is not because African Americans as an individual have made bad choices. It's because of all the racist, purposeful efforts that this country has made to differentiate the wealth between African Americans and other populations. Specifically, specifically redlining and the way that we welcomed home African American men from World War II. Have you heard of redlining a little bit? Redlining is a really interesting thing because it, like Bloomberg, again yesterday, was like, ah, redlining, that's smart investment, right? And what redlining was and is, because it still continues to today, is banks would say, this neighborhood is a bad risk for investment. And they'd put a red line around that neighborhood. And as it turns out, most of these neighborhoods that were redlined were African, traditionally African American neighborhoods. So what happens if you can't get a loan, right? Most of you, if you own a home, if you own a car, you've gotten a loan. You can't just go and buy something with the money you have in your wallet. You have to get a loan to accumulate wealth. And if a bank won't give you a loan, then you can't accumulate wealth. And that was a purposeful, mindful effort by the banks in this country and the leaders of this country to not give traditional black neighborhoods opportunity to accumulate wealth. Similarly, when African American men came back from World War II, they were not able to qualify for the GI Bill. Now, my dad, who was a German refugee, came to this country when he was 12, uh, left Nazi Germany, came to this country, went to high school in Los Angeles, and then went into the Army when he was 17 years old. Came out, 1950, and he went to the University of Chicago on the GI Bill. Got a job as a computer scientist, bought a house, bada bing, bada bong, here I am, right? with my family having some wealth. That is how white people were able to accumulate wealth. But if you were denied because of the color of your skin access to the GI Bill, you couldn't. So these are the reasons why we have such a disparity in homelessness is because of this purposeful effort around denying African Americans access to wealth. Not to mention slavery, Jim Crow, and mass incarceration. So these are very important things. I'm very proud to be leading a group from UCSF and two weeks to Alabama, including the provost and the uh, chair of the Department of Family Medicine, chair of pediatrics. Um, we are all going down to a tour, beginning in Birmingham, then Selma, Gee's Bend, and then ending in Montgomery, a five-day pilgrimage, where we're going to end at the 
a Peace and Justice Memorial, otherwise known as the Lynching Museum uh, in Montgomery. And I cannot encourage you all enough, strongly enough, to take this tour, because you don't feel the racial disparities in this country until you see a memorial for the 4,500 people who were killed, who were murdered because of their color of their skin between uh, Reconstruction and 1940. It is an incredible memorial. I went there last year. We go with a group from Glide Church, uh, and it, it's, it's an extraordinary experience. All right. San Franciscans typically come from San Francisco. So in this study, we looked at where people were living before they became homeless. And 70% of the people who were on the streets of San Francisco were living in San Francisco the night before they came up, became homeless for the first time. And of those 70%, the average amount of time that they were housed in San Francisco was 10 years. So we have unquestionable data that if you build it, they do not come. No matter how beautiful the housing is that you build, people who are on the streets of San Francisco are the people who have built San Francisco. And as, we, as the age, as I'll spend a lot of time about the aging of homeless population, they cannot keep up with income through hard labor, and they end up on the streets. That is where we are today, and we are doing it on purpose. And it is on purpose that we need to fix it. Now, not all populations are doing as badly as the general adult homeless population in San Francisco. We have done quite an extraordinary job in this country to reduce and end homelessness for veterans. Now, I take care of homeless veterans in my practice at the downtown clinic, the VA clinic on uh, 3rd and Harrison. But this graph shows this you know, pretty consistent reduction in the number of homeless veterans, despite more veterans aging and more veterans coming out of the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, we still have housed people successfully over time. What have we done differently for veterans than we do for the rest of the world, rest of the United States? Any, anyone know about how veteran homelessness gets ended? 72 communities around the country have, have uh, zero, or fun we call functional zero for veterans. Well, it's housing, but it's something that goes on somewhere inside the beltway, right? The, veteran, the VA provides the services, but it's actually housing and urban development, HUD, which gives the vouchers, this thing called HUD-VASH, or VA Supportive Housing Vouchers, because the Republicans and the Democrats work together to pass legislation to basically fund a housing program for a population who happened because of a lot of usual random events to enter the military rather than not. So most of the people who I take care of are homeless veterans who are recently housed. They were 18 and they caught a case for something, DUI, something went down, and the judge said, military or jail, which do you want? And they, oh, go to the military. And because of that, and that reason alone, they're not homeless, and their brother, who may have chosen jail for a month, is on the streets. Not right. We know how to end homelessness. We can do it at scale easily within the amount of money that we have in this country. If we took a teeny bit away from defense, we would have no trouble funding enough HUD vouchers for every homeless person in this country, and we just don't do it. That is not where our values are exhibiting today. This is one of, I think, my favorite slide, because it really hits home as to what is going on today. So this is a slide from Los Angeles, where they looked at the number of homeless veterans on the streets in 2018. And there were what, 2,000, I can't see without my glasses, uh, 3,886 <coughs> veterans on the streets of Los Angeles in 2018. In 2019, there were 3,874, basically the same amount. Oh my God, we have failed Los Angeles veterans. What, a, what losers we are. But then if you look at that next bar graph, we housed, in that same year, 2,824 veterans, permanently housed, who are still housed today. What does this slide mean to you? How, does, what, how do you make the math work? 
but you can pretty much say how many new homeless veterans there are in that one year. Since the rate has stayed the same, the number of veterans who've hit the streets is exactly pretty much equal to the number of veterans we've housed. We are bailing a ship that is leaking. We cannot fix this problem. We cannot build our way out of this problem unless we figure out how to prevent people falling into homelessness in the first place. This, one, this graph really sears into my brain because we always, how many new homeless people are there? What's really going on? But in this one year, mostly young men have become homeless on the streets of Los Angeles at an incredible rate. What a failure of our social system. And the population of homeless people are aging. And I know this is gonna sound silly, but they're aging about one year every year, just like the rest of us. No, but the average age of the homeless population is increasing about one year every year, 0.6 years every year to be exact. So in 1990, the percent of adults who are homeless over the age of 50 was only 11%. So think of you know young Dr. Bamberger with hair, uh, just finishing residency, uh, and all the people I took care of were pretty much young people, right? Only 10% were over the age of 50. Um, 10 years later, 13 years later, 37% of the homeless population are over the age of 50. And then today, we've just crossed the average age of homeless people as being over the age of 50. So half of the homeless population in this country are over the age of 50 and half are under. So something happened to a group of people, this cohort effect, that is a combination of the way that we uh, arrested young black and brown men for crack predominantly, so putting a lot of people into jail and prison, and then they leave with a record, so it was very hard to get housed. In the 80s, a downturn in the economy, so again, black and brown men had a much higher rate of unemployment, and those things accumulate in terms of inability to get off the streets. So there's been this, this insult to the population that happened in the late 80s that has just accumulated. Now, the good news is there will be a cliff pretty soon that many of these people will die so that finally the rates of homelessness will go down. Woo-hoo. That's a great thing as a doctor to be looking forward to my population of people dying so that we can make some headway. We've got to do better. We've got to do better. This is another way to depict the same epidemiologic phenomena where you look at this dark blue curve, that's the age distribution of homeless adults, homeless male adults, in fact, in 1990, where the average age is in the like 30s, early 30s. Then the red is the 2000 census, looking at people around 40. And then the light blue at 2010, so that's even you know, nine, 10 years ago now, um, then there was getting close to 50. So it's like the gerbil and the python. It's a group of people getting older. Being old and homeless is not good. Being homeless at all is not good, but being old and homeless is bad. One thing that's really shocking about homelessness and older age, I think most of us in this room are over the age of 50, but here in this slide, you can see that half of all the people over the age of 50 who are homeless, and this is in Oakland, Margaret Cashel study. I'll say this again, half of all the people who are homeless on the streets of Oakland over the age of 50 were not homeless for a day until they were over the age of 50. So for those of you who are around 50, think about what it must have been like to live your whole life housed and then have to somehow make do at 50 with being on the streets let alone 60 or 70 or 90. Pretty grim. And being older and homeless, as I said, is not good for your health. If you look at Margot's data, she shows that among the 
geriatric population, which is over the age of 50 in this setting. Um, these are the impairments that are exhibited by this cohort of 364 people that she's following at Oakland. The one on the bottom is the one that really hits you hard. If half of all the seniors who are on the streets in Oakland are incontinent of urine, think how hard it is to get a job or get a home when you smell like pee. Pretty grim. So, why do we need this $30 million Benioff initiative to tell us these terrible things? Where are, where's the hope? I'm not gonna leave you hopeless, I'm setting you up with sadness, hopefully to motivate for success and opportunity. So, what do we know? Well, it's so simple that it's kind of embarrassing to say that the treatment for homelessness is housing, right? So we have ample national evidence that if you house somebody and provide services, they stay housed. So we need more housing vouchers, the way that these HUD vouchers, HUD VASH vouchers work, is if you're an individual and you get a voucher, you can go find any landlord within reason. You pay a third of your income towards rent. And the difference between what the landlord charges you and what you can pay is picked up by this voucher. Ben Carson, who's the secretary of HUD, does not want to promote any further HUD vouchers, except for veterans. So needless to say, we're having more people on the streets. And they try to flip it around saying, well, the reason why there's so many homeless people on the streets right now is because we move them into housing. You did housing first. That's why there are so many more people on the streets. I'm like, what? So that, that is honestly what they're saying these days. They have a new homeless czar, a guy named Robert Marbutt, who was appointed by Trump uh, mid-December where my friend Matt Doherty, who's here in town for the National Alliance to End Homelessness Conference that's going on in Oakland, was fired overnight. He and I worked together at the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness under the Obama administration. We we're doing great work about expanding this idea about housing first, get people housed, and then we can help them with their mental illness and substance use. But there are other ways to do it. It doesn't have to be a permanent voucher. We found that for veterans, about one of every two veterans that come engaged to the homeless service system, only take, only get engaged for a brief period of time and then able to get out of homelessness on their own. So sometimes we just need to use like a flexible short-term housing assistance. We haven't really figured out how to get the government to spend money for a short term just to get people back on their feet. We need to increase the stock of affordable housing. So one way to fix the problem is to give people enough money so they can go into the open market. Another way to fix the problem is to build housing that rents at a low cost. It's either raise wealth or lower cost and make housing uh, affordable. And then, and there are ways to do that too, again, by using low interest loans uh, and a variety of other techniques. They're well known, boys don't have enough of it. It's gotta accelerate. And then one thing I'm really interested in right now, and we'll spend most of the time at the end here, talking about how can we increase the wages of homeless people? How can we lean into the strengths that homeless people often have to retrain them to get back into the workforce? You have 3%, 4% unemployment rate going on in this country right now, but there are actually some sectors that have just great demand in terms of um, uh, workers, particularly the home health aides, um, direct service providers, plumbers, electricians. So we need to reduce poverty through increasing the wages. We can't give people just minimum wage, how many counties in this country are there where someone who makes minimum wage and works full time can afford a two bedroom apartment? How many counties do you think? Zero. So even if you go to Lincoln, Nebraska, or I don't know, Des Moines, uh, someplace where you think it's gonna be inexpensive, it's not, the, the minimum wage does not keep up with the cost at all. So we gotta increase the wages. And you know, in this city, we gotta hire people at 24, 25, 28 bucks an hour, or we're not gonna have a diverse, uh, vibrant city. We're gonna have a bunch of you know, young tech workers 
with their Star Wars t-shirts, walking around South of Market, and they're the ones who are gonna be able to afford to live here. And that's not where I wanna live. I don't know where you guys wanna live. Um, we gotta reduce the wealth disparity. There are lots of things that you know, Bernie Sanders has talked about, Elizabeth Warren talked about, even Amy Klobuchar has talked about you know, how to tax the wealthy and use that money for housing and other services. You know, unequivocally, we have to have a change in the administration if we're gonna make headway on this. And four years from now, I don't, I don't know what I'm gonna do if that happens. So. Vote, please, and vote for the right person. Um, and then racism. As I mentioned before, it, we can't talk about homelessness without talking about the purposeful efforts to keep people who are African American and Latino out of the wealth, out of the American dream. It has been a purposeful effort. So, any questions about the sad stuff? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's an excellent question. I don't know, I was thinking about that a lot. Like, would they use a certain hue of skin or how is that working? But I think for the most part, it was a segregated army. So if you were in a particular uh, division, your division upon exit wouldn't qualify for access to the GI Bill. I don't know if that was done by just not having people fill out the paperwork or if it was just done by actually purposefully denying those specific divisions access to that benefit. It's a, it's a, you know, I, I would love to know more about that history. Yeah, no, it's, it's I, I have read about it enough to feel confident that it's true, but the actual mechanics of how that worked is, I think, would be really f interesting to learn. Like, what would happen if an African-American guy would go to the benefits uh, office in downtown San Francisco in 1950 and say, I'd like to enroll in the GI Bill, would they kick him out? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, so to, to try to repeat the question as best I can for these guys, how do the HUD-VASH vouchers work specifically is what you're talking about. Because there are also these things called Section 8 vouchers, which are the similar thing for non-veterans, just way too few of them. So the way the HUD-VASH works is you have to be homeless for a year and have a disabling condition. And how do they know? Which part? That you're disabled, you're disabled in the first so to, you have to actually have some documentation to show that you've been on the streets for a year. Right? Well, you know, so you stayed in a shelter a year ago, right? So you don't necessarily have to have a continuous paper trail. But, and, and you know, HUD-VASH is much more liberal in allowing access to this resource. We all want to do the same thing. So, you know, we want to get homeless veterans off the streets. So we actually may achieve functional zero for homeless veterans in San Francisco pretty soon. We have two beautiful new buildings that just opened, one in Colma, another one, uh, Ed Lee Apartments uh, in the um, Mission Bay area, is 100% chronically homeless veterans buildings. They're each about 60 units. So you know, we're getting close to actually having enough units to meet the demand for veterans, which is fantastic and also makes my blood boil, right? It just, it's fair, but not fair. I don't know. Anyway, so you, you've been homeless for a year. You engage in services. So if you're really disorganized with your mental illness and you can't fill out paperwork, you can't get in the door, you don't get services, right? There's outreach that can help you, but you got you to gotta behave somewhat. And that's challenging for some of the most disorganized people. We have outreach teams, and we have uh, these intensive case management using something called assertive community treatment strategies. And in, in the VA, we call it HPAC, Homeless Patient Aligned Care Team. And we get on the streets, we help people, we get, walk them through the process, and we're pretty good at getting most veterans housed. And how would you think that this approach is application? Yeah, I mean, part of the challenge is you have to have enough vacant units if you're just going to use scattered site, landlord-based vouchers. But then if we build 100% project-based facilities, then we can fill them up with whom we want. And that's mostly what I've done in San Francisco is this project-based idea. We, as I said, 43 buildings and 2,000 units is what I brought to market uh, before I retired from the health department. A question in the back? Yeah. Yeah. So the question was how, about the prevalence of mental illness and substance use disorders among the homeless population in San Francisco. So the important thing is to differentiate between what we call chronically homeless and recently homeless. So for the chronically homeless, which has a very specific definition of having been continuously homeless for 12 months, of having three episodes of homelessness over 36 months that have accumulated to be more than 12 months and having a disability, that's what chronic homelessness is. 
Among that population, the prevalence is pretty high. 70, 80% have one, two, or a three morbid conditions. But for the newly homeless people, that's not the case. And what's really important, I'm going to get to this now, is the heterogeneity of the homeless population has not been really attended to by embracing that not all homeless people are the same. And some people need the treatment called permanent supportive housing with wraparound services, rent paid for in a good building. Some people need a shallow rent subsidy and some people need a job. But this city has done a terrible job of sorting people to the right treatment. And for, unless you're pretty sick or been on the streets for a really long time, you're not gonna be offered housing. So what are we doing with those rest of the people while we wait? It was one other question, then I'm gonna move on. No, we just let the market, we let the market run the system, right? In, in you know, Jimmy Carter, you know, the Great Society, War on Poverty, even the Nixon administration was investing in affordable housing. HUD's budget has gone down one eighth of the total amount it was in 1972. So we had, as I said, a surplus of affordable housing. People in New York City could, even if you were making you know, minimum wage, you could find a place to live. You can't now. The rents went up, the stock went down. You can't use the money you have to get a place to live. It's the economics. Yeah, well, good. You're very welcome. <laughs> so while we wait to get back to where we should be, to build enough housing so that everyone has what should be a human right, which is a home, what are we going to do? And this is the area of homeless policy things get really controversial. Because I am a believer that we should do everything we can and nothing is bad. We should evaluate it so we don't continue to spend our money that isn't helping people, but we got to do everything. So that includes planned encampments, RV parks. Uh, we have to use vacant lots for whatever we can. Yesterday, Governor Newsom gave a big speech. It was supposed to be the state of the state, but he just made it all about homelessness. And one thing he did is freed up 286 surplus state properties to be used for homeless services across the entire state. That is going to be fun. We got to be smart about that, and we got to build these things well. So low barrier, voluntary shelters. We talk about shelters as having the three Ps, partners, pets, and property. So we, if you tell a homeless person you can't bring your loved one in, you can't bring your pet in, and you can't bring your stuff in, then the guy's not going in, right? And think about it for yourself, right? You're with your partner, uh, you're, say you're a male partner and you have a female partner, and you're saying, well, I got a slot at, at next door shelter. You didn't? Good luck tonight, honey. See you in the morning. Hell no. I'm not doing that. So if you can't go in as partners, you're not going in. And so shelters have, you know, there, there are fidelity processes to what good shelters are. Low barrier, harm reduction, three Ps. Okay. We also need to keep people alive from overdose. So a safe consumption facility where people can go into a safe facility and inject drugs and not overdose is not how I plan to practice medicine. But I, I got to do it now. If we have a home for everybody, I don't know how many people injected drugs earlier today. But if you did, you probably did it in the property in your own home. Fine. Give enough home, you can inject drugs in your own home. I don't need a safe consumption facility. But until we do that, we got to keep people alive. So if they do overdose, we can revive them there. Right? You can't get a dead drug user clean. We've got to keep people alive long enough so they can treat their illness. Um, we have a lot of street outreach teams, medical care, and we have to allow people to age in place. So since the population is aging as a group, even if we get them into housing, we need to have the services to serve them indoors. Um, we need to test proven strategies. One of the things I would love to see done with Proposition C, if we did get our $300 million a year, is I would like to give every senior, in this case I'm talking people over the age of 62, a housing voucher of $900 if they are 138% of the federal poverty level or less. Everyone can only be used for housing, whether you're homeless or housed. It costs about $45 million a year for this entire city, so one-sixth of our Prop C money. Could we prevent any seniors from becoming homeless and end homelessness for all seniors with a relatively meager 
expenditure on the tax of companies of $50 million a year or more. Wouldn't that be cool? Right now, we have to worry about the rents going up, right? More money in, rents go up, landlords get richer, but we could do it. So that's, that's something that I hope to use uh, this research opportunity to study. The last bit I'm going to talk about is this thing I call Stone Soup University. So uh, this summer, I visited this place in southeastern Colorado. Has anyone been to southeastern Colorado? You have been to southeastern Colorado. Can you describe what southeastern Colorado is like? It's been a long time. This is where the grandparents met each other. All right. But it is the plains. It is the plains. It's not the rock. It's not the rock. Yeah. This is the fairly it, flat eastern plains. Exactly. Plains. It is wow. not. Beautiful. Dust. It was dust. Yeah. Dust. And Kansas actually took the water from, the, from Colorado. So if you, you actually go across the border into Kansas, and all of a sudden you see all these wheat fields. In Colorado, there's nothing growing because the water was sucked all the way to Kansas. Anyway, southeastern Colorado, there's this old TB hospital called Fort Lyon, which is about 250 acres, uh, where the Colorado Coalition for Homelessness got control of this facility, and offered to any homeless person in the entire state that overnight, pretty much, they can go to this facility. And do you know what they can do there? Nothing. They don't have to do anything. The one common condition among every homeless person I've ever cared for is trauma. And the treatment for trauma is safety. So Fort Lyon is a place where people who have been living with trauma all their lives can just go and recover. They can stay a day. They can stay a month. They can stay three years. They get a place to sleep. They get decent food. They can't use drugs. They can earn a GED. They can earn an associate's degree. And that's about it. That's not enough for me. I want to do Fort Lyon 2.0. But I love this slide because it's a picture I took. Beautiful facility, but I, you know this was not for me, but I like it. Watch out, slow down. That's how you're gonna recover. The men I spoke to there were really amazing. They were so inspiring to spend time with. One guy said, you know, I didn't know the birds sang until I had been here eight months. Another guy said, you know, if I get into a beef with anybody here, I go over to that acre. That's my acre. No one bothers me in my acre. And there were 288 of them others out there that he'd go to. So there's plenty of room. We can do this with the surplus land we have in California. We can make a regional Fort Lyon-like facility. Another program I visited in New York City is called Howie the Harp Center. It's a funny name. Uh, but it's a really interesting facility run by something called Community Access. It's on 125th in Harlem. Uh, and it's a six-month intensive training program for people with severe mental illness. You can't qualify for the program unless you have a primary mental health diagnosis. And despite the rigor of this program, having to show up every day, five days a week, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., you get paid while you're there, but when you leave, a vast majority of them get a job. A starting salary of $45,000 a year. We are not doing this in San Francisco or in California. We are not leaning into the strengths of people who have lived experience and are so good at helping other people to get through the system because they have been through the system and succeeded. Who better to teach people how to succeed than people who have succeeded, right? So there are lots of those folks out there on the streets of San Francisco today who are waiting for an opportunity to use their skills that they have lived to develop. So what are the components of what I'm calling Stone Soup University? First of all, it has to be voluntary. Right now, Robert Marbot, who started this thing called Haven for Hope in San Antonio, he believes that homeless people need to be coerced into shelter. So he's using the police force to arrest people and say you can go to jail or go to shelter. That does not work. Criminalizing homeless people, besides being unconstitutional, doesn't work. It just adds to more burdens for the homeless person to get housed. And people do not need to be coerced into housing. I can assure you that the number one user of the healthcare system in this city, 
patient of mine who was drunk almost every day, in a wheelchair, didn't have a cerebellum, so he had this terrible aphasia. Um, when he wouldn't go into the shelter, because it wasn't safe for him, but when I rolled him into the fifth floor of this apartment called Mission Creek, overlooking Mission Bay, and he went into that door, he signed that lease in 30 seconds. Many people don't want to go indoors because going indoors is not safe. But if you have a beautiful, decent place, just like all of us, just like all of us, you have a beautiful, decent place to live, you want to live there. Have sex with whom you want to, watch whatever Netflix you want, you can cook your own ramen, that's what we want to do. And not having those opportunities is a reason to say no. So, it has to be voluntary. I want to be clean and sober, though I'm kind of wavering on that one. Self-govern, I love that one about Fort Lyon. They have a, a, a tenants council that determines all the rules of the place. They only have like 10 staff for the 250 people at Fort Lyon. They keep themselves going. Recovery model, get their GED, and then we can train them to work in fields that we need, in-home support work, direct service providers, peer advocacy, and a trade like plumbing and electricians, which we don't have enough of, so we can't build the housing to get us out of this dilemma in the first place. This is a picture, four pictures, of a place called the Sonoma Developmental Center. Has anyone heard of this place? You look like you have a little bit. So quick history lesson, seven developmental centers across the state of California, housing about 15,000 people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in the mid-60s, up into the mid-60s. A group of moms got together, said my kids who are institutionalized should be able to live in the community. They went to Sacramento, they started a movement, and they got the legislators to fund 700 group homes all over the state, and they emptied the developmental centers. Agnews, who was in Santa Clara, closed, it became Sun Microsystem. Uh, Lanterman, which was in Pomona, became part of Cal Poly. Uh, then Sonoma Developmental Center had the last person sleeping there in December of 2018. So a little over a year ago, just closed. It's 800 acres, has 500 buildings. They look like this, they're nice. They're nice buildings, it's sitting there completely vacant. So when I heard that the governor had identified 287 vacant state properties, I went right to that map and I went right up to uh, Eldridge, which is a half mile south of, of uh, Glen Ellen, and there it is on that map. And Fairview Developmental Center in Costa Mesa is also on that map. And I've been appointed by the VA secretary to oversee a plot of land in West LA, if any of you have been to Los Angeles. There's this huge VA par parcel, 288 acres, uh, which was bequeathed to the VA for housing for veterans in 1887, um, which has not been built with any housing or very little. There's an article in the New York Times earlier this week, you may have seen. So we I can have three campuses of Stone Soup University. A northern campus in Sonoma Developmental Center, a southern campus at Fairview Developmental Center, and a veterans campus in Los Angeles. And we can move in 500 homeless people who want to move in, not forcing anyone, so not internment camp, who want to move in, and while they're there, a month, six months, a year, whatever it takes, whatever they want, they can learn a trade, and when they're ready to leave, we give them a $900 housing voucher that they get for a year. They go back to the community they came from, whether they came from Oakland, Santa Clara, Napa, Santa Rosa, Eureka, wherever they came from to the Northern California campus. They go back to where they came from. They use that $900 voucher, to, $900 voucher a month to be able to get a place to live. And during that time, they practice their trade and they get an income. It's not gonna solve all homelessness but it could reduce the number of people who need permanent housing by 20%. And we're talking about a, you know, a couple billion dollar, $10 billion investment. We can save $2 billion. That's a lot. And the difference between being on the dole and earning your keep is big in terms of health. So that's, that's my moonshot idea. There are people who live near this place who so may not be so happy about my idea, but maybe you guys can go out there and convince them that it would be cool. So, concluding the situation, looking at the homeless, the healthcare delivery system, 
I see homeless people sort of as in three tiers. There are the really sick homeless people who are too sick for even permanent supportive housing with wraparound services. Some of them might need to be conserved for a week or two to be able to help them to understand they gotta be off drugs enough to get into housing, but we have to have the housing that's for them. And that's the level of care called assisted living or residential care facility, board and cares. We do not expand that space at all. We have almost no stock in that level of care, housing stock. We have skilled nursing facilities. We have permanent supportive housing, but not enough. We have almost nothing in between. So we need to expand that. And we need to have this, what I call a social justice accountable care organization. So these are accountable care organizations which are designed to take care of a specific population, a special needs population, and we need to build this from the ground up, recognizing the reason we are coming to work is to make the world a more just place. And we have to have the ideas of, of restorative justice and racial equity built in from the ground up. And if we can hire staff with that kind of training to work in this kind of setting, we can really create an amazing place. So think about homeless people as high needs, needing assisted living, getting people off the streets into this place. We need something called assertive community treatment, which is a longitudinal care, low uh, patient to staff ratios, integrated between psychiatrists and street uh, health care workers. We all work together, engage people over time, move them indoors. Low need, people who have been recently homeless, which is half of all the homeless people in San Francisco right now, we need to get them either diverted from homelessness, get them back home, get them connected up with family, or get them a job. And then from the middle, which is unfortunately a pretty big chunk, we need just more housing with services. It's not that complicated. We can afford this. We can afford this. It is not gonna be free. We can't continue to say, which I've done for 20 years, that it's less expensive to be a, uh, housed than it is to be homeless. It may be in the long run, but that's not, we're not gonna free up the money to get the innovation done. We've gotta buy this stuff, and we gotta do it now. And if we don't, we are failing as a society. This is the issue of our time. And we have that opportunity to make it better for many people who we think are other but many people who are us. And if we can continue to recognize that we are all in this society together, we can find a way to make it work. So that's those slides. And I'd love to have a little discussion for a little while to fix the racial inequities. I have some ideas on that. I'm not sure how, re it's really hard to balance fairness with justice. And what I mean, I'll give you an example of two buildings that we built in San Francisco. Both were owned by Glide Church. One was at 125 Mason. So it's between, it's Mason between uh, Eddie and Ellis. And one was next door at 149 Mason. 125 Mason was built with public dollars and then Access to these units were done through a lottery. So there was an announcement, posters were put all over the city, and anyone who was poor, 30% area median income or less, could apply to be a tenant there. They got 3,000 applications. About 2,900 of the people who applied were Asian Americans. That's how it works in San Francisco when you have a very brief advertisement, people are talking about it among themselves and one community takes over. So that building is full with people who are poor and need a home, fantastic, but they're not African Americans. Next building, built next door, was handed in terms of access to the health department where I was running. And we took a look at all the homeless people in San Francisco, and we selected the sickest, craziest, most drug addicted people we could find, and we prioritized those folks into housing. And they were reflective of the general uh, racial breakdown of a homeless population in general. So, which is right? You know, a lottery is fair. Selecting people based on their medical condition is not. 
which is just. If we build a building in West Oakland and require that we put preferences as to who gets access to that unit by who has been sleeping near that building, we could probably have a building that's more reflective of the community. But most poor neighborhoods are the least interested in having housing made up of people who are living with homelessness. So it gets really challenging when you try to not NIMBY our buildings. These are difficult problems to solve. We are trying to fix a problem that is very entrenched by our historic pro uh, ways of doing things. The best thing to do is to recognize the racial inequities that have gotten us here and stop them. Stop redlining, give people equal access to free education, and overcome the inequities that have got us to this wealth disparity in the first place. Well, I mean, it depends on what studies and how you're doing it, right? So for many systems, it's an irrelevant question. And for other systems, it matters. And it matters what case you got. So if you're a registered sex offender, for example, then you're not allowed to receive any federal funds. So I have a lot of my patients who are really sick and old who I can't house because even funding that doesn't come through HUD there's loans that go into building these buildings which come from the federal government and they're restricted from being able to use it. So, you know, what cases you have, but something, I don't have the data handy, but something like 50% of all homeless people in San Francisco have had at least one night in jail or prison. So it's a very common experience. And also, when you're on the streets, you get arrested and thrown in jail for uh, quality of life things. So it's a, it's a common thing, people exiting prison have a very high rate of homelessness, something like 80 percent, um, because we don't provide the housing. And they've done great work with that in Los Angeles by integrating their housing system for homeless people as the same system as people exiting jail, so that they can all access this incredible expansion of housing Los Angeles didn't talk much about, but they've housed 10,000 people in the last two years. So they're really doing extraordinary work. Again, through taxes, they have a local tax initiative called Measure H, a county tax initiative called HHH. And they've just put huge amounts of money into the system to get more people off the, off the streets. Great work, but if you've been in Skid Row in Los Angeles lately, it ain't looking good because we haven't fixed the inflow. So that's sort of the thought I'll leave you with, inflow. The new homeless people, the economically homeless people, the people who have built our cities, who are now on the streets of our cities, we haven't figured out how to prevent at all. So thank you very much.